1969. Three men begin the journey of 240,000 miles from the Earth to its heavenly satellite. This is the cumulative work of 300,000 people, a decade of effort in the challenge of a president. The goal was unimaginable, and the cost, enormous. And because the lives of those three astronauts were at stake, for those men and women still on the ground, failure was not an option. And so it was in 1969, with the entire world holding its breath, that mankind achieved the unachievable. And it all started here. Only 66 years before the Apollo 11 mission, two brothers walked the sandy dunes of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They too were ready to take a chance on the idea that the world could be different because of them. The plans of Wilbur and Orville Wright were improbable, but not impossible. The cost was substantial, but to them, worth every cent. The work went on for years, but now, each and every one of our lives today is different because of their persistence. In their wildest dreams, the witnesses of history at Kitty Hawk never imagined that their 120-foot flight would pave the way for human beings to someday walk on the moon. And yet, 66 years later, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin did exactly that, leaving footprints in the dust. In 1969, as a two-month-old Janelle Emerson slept in her crib. Honestly, the majority of my childhood before 18 is loneliness. I always felt lonely. I felt like no one was for me. My parents divorced when I was 11. There was abuse within our family, and it was just dark. It was a dark place. I started having anxiety attacks and depression by the time I was 16. I mean, I turned to alcohol early. I turned to partying early. And when I went down that path in middle school and high school, it was just darker and deeper. I sat in that loneliness and it just became home. And so a week before I graduated high school, I had gone to the church and I remember that youth pastor, Reed Hughes, talking to me about Jesus. And so I talked to him about my feelings and everything I was struggling with. And he led me to the Lord, May 10th, 1987. And I knew then that I was making a 180 degree turn. I knew that night. So I grew up in a pretty violent household that had a lot of alcoholism in it. It was a very lonely home because they were so busy fighting that I just didn't really matter. They fought on and off until I was 16 and my dad finally got arrested and he got pulled out of the home. And at that point my mom transitioned into being an abuser. One night when I was 16, my mom's dog bit me because uh, my mom and I were fighting. We got him off and I was laying in the yard bleeding, waiting for the ambulance to come in. She came out there and told me that she hated me and she would rather keep the dog, and that's when I decided to leave. So when I moved out, I started living with a boyfriend and it just started this whole trajectory of just bouncing from relationship to relationship. I would just define myself by whatever that they would say about me and however long I could hold a relationship, but I didn't have any worth and I didn't have anybody telling me I was worth anything. Uh, so it was just empty. I spent a season in my early 20s in church, and through that I, I met some people and just ran into some situations with them where I was really in need, and they kind of turned me away and almost shamed me. And because I had had those interactions, it was really easy for me from that to then just generalize that Christians were hypocrites. But yeah, they just didn't seem like they at all cared. They only seemed like they cared about themselves. 
I mean, when you already believe that you're worthless, and then you go to a place that's supposed to tell you that you're worth something, and the people don't. It really only dug that hole deeper for me. So in 2014, I started going back to college at the University of North Georgia for science. And through science, I just felt totally empowered. I could understand the concepts like it was nothing. It was easy for me, it came natural to me. And it was the first time I really felt like I had worth because I felt smart. And nobody had ever told me I was smart or capable my whole life. And so as I learned about science, man, just the rage against Christians was just fueled in me. Christians are hypocritical and they're repressive. It was just like normal to just slam Christianity. And I was in this class called The Mechanisms of Disease. They remember talking about white blood cells and the way that your body knows the specific type of infection that it needs to respond to, whether it's a parasite or a pathogen. And it's super specific and it's very intricate. And I just had this moment when I thought, oh no, oh no, oh no. You can't tell me that billions of years of chance have gotten us here. I think it's from a higher power. And in that moment, it was just full on panic because everything that I thought I knew about Christianity and God and science, it just all collided and I, it just shattered my identity again. In the same semester, I was teaching organic chemistry and there was another TA with me teaching organic chemistry. And it just grew this really sarcastic friendship. And over time, I started to realize that he wasn't just like this sarcastic man. He was actually really gentle and kind and steady. And then I realized that he was a Christian. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> I was really diving deep into young adults at Passion City Church, and I was just really trying to focus on my faith with God at that point. Along that same timeline, it was down in my basement with my mom and my sister. We were watching a show, and then after the show ended, I kind of just turned around and I was like, hey, I'm dating this girl that is like six years older than me, and she's not a Christian, and I'm just confused. And I kind of had this sense and feeling that I needed to try to step in and, and talk to Janelle. I really had this expectation that she was going to reject me or not think that I was good enough for her son, just based on what I had learned from other Christians, feeling like I had no worth or value. And it was not that way at all. She accepted me wholeheartedly, and she made me feel and know that I had value. And that was easy for me to say because I had come from that broken place. I was that broken girl. And I'm like, this may be her one chance to see grace, to see love like she's never experienced before. And I had had that. And she was accepting and she was kind. And you could just tell that she was generous. And I don't mean financially, I mean with her time and with her love and with her space. And she sat with me in those hard conversations a lot because I still was pretty unsure about Christians and what it meant to be a Christian. I had a lot of questions and I had done a lot of things that I didn't think allowed me to be a Christian. I thought I was kind of disqualified at this point. And she modeled that idea that like you can never be too far gone for God's love. Yeah, it's just amazing to see both of my parents, uh, specifically my mom, just be loving and graceful and, and gentle towards Sarah. And she was just such a gift of generosity in that for me. I just started attending Passion to see where my relationship with God could go. And every time I saw her at church, she was becoming someone different. And then in 2017, Janelle invited me to Passion Conference for the first time. Jesus was already working in her life in turning her heart toward Him. And at the very end, um, it was the year that Sean debuted Worthy of Your Name. I remember the Purple Cross and just closing my eyes and just having this full revelation of how beautiful God was. She starts worshiping with such abandon, tears flowing down her face. And just listening to when Sean is saying, you're my author, you're my maker, you know, my redeemer, all of those things, and thinking, oh, like, you really are that for me. 
she said, and it was literally like a veil was lifted in that moment. And the beauty of Jesus that had never been there before. And I was like, that's it. And that moment at Passion Conference, that was really the lift off for me that really pushed me forward into a wholehearted pursuit of Jesus. It's been amazing to see my parents leave a legacy of faith. They have modeled generosity with their time and their resources so well to us. Yeah, so when we first got married, we talked a lot about kind of what we wanted to do. And we were like, you know, we have this opportunity to say, um, we're going to be different, right? This, yeah. is, this is an opportunity for us to change our, our lives and our kids' lives. And we actually have four kids, crazy. And we knew that we wanted to put a stake in the ground of our faith, of our trust in Jesus, and of what life would look like in generations to come. Watching Janelle and Mike really stake this legacy in the ground and watching it trickle down through their family and looking at our kids, Zeke and Valley, and knowing that like they get to benefit from that legacy and that we now have this opportunity to establish a legacy for them as well. So we've been married uh, 32 years. Um, have great kids in uh, March of this year. Sorry. <sighs> Went into normal uh, medical testing and was able to get a diagnosis of stage four prostate cancer. You have so many people come up to you after you have this diagnosis and like, oh, let's pray about this. I'm going to believe for healing. I'm going to do this or that or the other. But we had always gotten to the point where we're like, I don't want to focus on that, right? I always want the focus to be on glorification of the Lord through all this. If he gets the glory, no matter what happens, that's, that's the legacy I want to leave. And remembering where the stake was made years ago, that faith and that place of generosity and going, it's, that's the same. That hasn't changed. And so that's what we're going to hold on to. And we'll do the treatments and we will pray for healing. And we are going to live every day with joy and suffering in the same place. We don't know how much time we've been given, and none of us do, actually. And we wanna make sure that our legacy is full of generosity. We wanna be able to serve in our house as much as possible. We wanna be able to serve others. We wanna be able to give generously and make sure that that legacy of faith in Jesus, that that's what we're leaving. Faith leaves a legacy. In just two generations, humanity pushed back against gravity, broke the sound barrier, and flung the records of our achievements into the deepest regions of space, all because a group of people intensely focused with their time, talent, and treasure just decided to. In one generation, God brought the nobles' family from loneliness to hope and built a family that proclaims his goodness to the world. We are now 13 years into the story of Passion City Church. What will our 66-year legacy look like? Each of us entered this story at a different point, but we are all builders of its legacy. By the word of God, by the power of his spirit, and in the name of Jesus, who is able to bring the dead to life, we are here together in this moment, opening our hands with our time, our talent, our treasure, and believing that we can change the world around us. We can be witnesses to resurrection stories. We can live to see the impossible become 
possible, the miraculous, the wondrous, the above and beyond.